Uh, good morning. This is Michael Stonebreaker. Uh, I, my claim to fame is I am the original builder of Postgres way back when, uh, and I'm delighted to be talking to the Postgres Vision Conference. Uh, and I want to talk about uh, privacy. More specifically, I want to talk about database support for personal data. So what's this all about? Uh, technically, it's about what's come to be called personally identifiable information. PII is what it's, what it's called. Uh, that's actually a technical term. Uh, it's defined in the GDPR legislation, which I'll talk about in a sec. And it says when used alone or in conjunction with other data, it can identify an individual. So basically you want to, uh, you want to deal with information that allows uh, your identity to be revealed. And I'll just call this in the rest of the talk, uh, personal data. So, but technically it's PII. So what is personal data? Well, it's my social security number that identifies me uh, along with other attributes, my age, uh, my hobbies, uh, what kind of sneakers I wear, my address, my zip code, political party affiliation, uh, estimates of my net worth, all of that stuff is personal data. And I want to be able to control who gets to use it and for what purpose. So the problem is I want to limit the use of information that gets stored about me in all kinds of websites, all kinds of services. Uh, and the problem is being addressed in a variety of ways. So there is a thing called GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation. Uh, that's the law of the land in the EU. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, there's a similar California state statute that uh, has a lot of the same stuff that GDPR has. And I expect in the current climate that there will be a pile on of other stuff that will follow. Uh, I think I expect over the course of some period of time, there will probably be US wide legislation uh, that deals with personal data. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. And I'll talk about GDPR specifically because that's kind of actual legislation actually on the books in Europe and actually uh, European uh, information systems have to deal with it right now. So there is a bunch of stuff in GDPR, but there are two big issues that uh, I think are really interesting. The first one has to do with something called purposes, which I'll talk about in just a second. The second one is called the right to be forgotten, which is on a request, if, if you make a request to an information provider, I believe it's in a letter, uh, you ask them to delete all, all personally identifiable information and they must, be, they must comply. So on request, all personal data must be deleted. So I'll be talking about both purposes and the right to be forgotten. So we'll deal with purposes first. Uh, and you have to sort of rewire your brain a little bit because you guys are all used to Postgres uh, access control, SQL access control, which says that you're identified as a particular user and you have a bunch of rights uh, that you can read and write various data, you can grant access to others and so forth. So that's what SQL access control is, but that has nothing to do with purposes. Purposes are what the intent of your application is that's running the query. So your purpose might be to sell me something. So lots of, Add, add data uh, is basically about 
uh, targeting consumers to sell them something. Uh, in a medical world, uh, you might uh, your purpose might be to construct aggregate statistics uh, that are for social good. Uh, you could construct aggregate statistics for performance monitoring and so forth and so on. So there's lots of possible purposes that your query uh, could be trying to do. Uh, this is especially relevant in the medical world. So uh, there are a lot of medical, there's a lot of medical data on me in multiple hospital medical systems. And uh, right now, how would I want to control access to my medical records? Well, if, if I'm de-identified, then I'm so that you can't figure out it's me, then I'm happy to share anything. Uh, I'm a big fan of research. So uh, for medical research, I think I'm okay with uh, people using anything. If my insurance company asks, the answer is no. Uh, if the hospital is trying to optimize their uh, particular internal systems, you know, I think that's fine. And if people ask me for any other reason, then the answer is no, unless I specifically authorize it. So the idea is that the same data can be either okay or not okay, depending on what the purpose is for which uh, the data is being used. So GDPR says, the law of the land in Europe, I can specify for each possible purpose whether I want to opt in. Uh, otherwise, I opt out. And I expect over the course of the, of the future, uh, I expect purposes will have to be pretty fine grained. You know, like, like my example in, of medical records, that there may be a whole bunch of purposes and I can opt in or by default opt out of sharing my data for on any of them. So that's what purposes are all about. And I want to remind you all, if you haven't figured it out already, uh, this is orthogonal to SQL access control. So access control in Postgres is on tables and views and applies to uh, user names uh, who are logged in. And so individuals and or roles. Uh, so that's what access control is. Purposes are at whatever granularity makes sense, could be even individual cells of data, and they apply to applications. So the idea is that an application says, here's a query, and the purpose of this query is blah, 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 and that determines what data they can actually access. So nothing to do with SQL access control. And I, my suspicion is, database systems are going to have to support purposes uh, you know, and that will presumably uh, apply to Postgres. So this is easily handled inside the, da the database system. Uh, you can either do it using views, you can do it with some bitmaps. Uh, and so uh, a bunch of us uh, wrote a paper that we called Schengen, uh, uh, AKA uh, something dealing with Europe. Uh, so if you'd like the paper, we'd be happy to send it to you. It gives you a, a way to handle purposes inside the database system. It's a whole lot tougher to do it in application level or middleware code. And the reason to talk about all of this is that at some point Postgres is gonna have to do something. So this is just fair warning that this stuff is coming at you. Okay, with that, I wanna move to the right to be forgotten, which I think is really, really interesting. And the right to be forgotten, which is upon application, you have to delete everything you have on me, uh, is both a DBMS issue, as I'll talk about in a sec, it's an application issue uh, that we're going that you're almost certainly going to have to deal with. And then in GDPR, it's also an auditing issue, as I'll talk about later on in the talk. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. So let's 
first of all, talk about the right to be forgotten as it might apply to Postgres. So in my opinion, the easiest way to deal with the right to be forgotten is to view this as a database design problem. So the trouble with the right to be forgotten is, you know, PII data may be spread all over everywhere. And figuring out where it is and what it is and figuring out how to delete it is really painful. And the minute I add anything, I change you know, I change uh, where you have to go look to delete stuff. So if you just force a clean entity relationship schema, then you can make this problem wildly easier. So here's what you can do. Uh, you can use your favorite design tool uh, to, do, to deal with an entity relationship diagram. ERWIN is one, there's a whole bunch of others. Uh, so use your favorite ER design tool to construct an ER diagram of your data. And then uh, design tools have a button. You can push a button and it will spit out a set of tables in third normal form. Uh, if you change anything, you change the ER diagram, you push the button again, it, it spits out tables and you change the tables to the new stuff. So basically force a clean ER schema, which is then automatically mapped uh, into tables in the database. So how would this actually look? Well, let's just look at a, at a quick, simple example. Uh, here's one of my favorite ones, which is we have an, we have an employee entity and we record names and salaries and ages about employees. We have a department entity and we record D name and floor about department. And then we have a relationship called works in, which records the fact that an employee can work in one or more departments. So the data is two entities and a relationship. And this is the kind of view you get in an ER uh, design tool. So you have that, this is your view of the world. Uh, you, you view the data this way. So what happens next? Well, the way this is mapped by an ER tool into tables is you get an entity table for the employees, you get an entity table for departments, and you get an, a table for works in, that records the two keys, one of employees and one of departments. So this is the way it's mapped into, into actual tables. So here we are. Uh, and now how can we make this a lot easier? Well, the answer is uh, you query the database using the schema. So this is the way what you think of as the data that's there. Run any query that you want to. And under the sheets, I want to mess with stuff. So the way I want to mess with it is I don't want to use real entity keys uh, in relationships and all over the database for reasons that will become obvious in a second. And so I want to use a surrogate for every entity key. So if Mike Stonebreaker is an employee, uh, I'm going to have a, a random bit string uh, which is going to be the surrogate for me. So if I apply uh, surrogates for all the keys, then what I'm actually going to store is I'm going to store an employee entity table, which is going to have the surrogate key and the real key. So it's Mike Stonebreaker and then this long bit string. Uh, I'm going to have an entity uh, table for departments, the same surrogates, the same uh, real keys. And then I'm going to have the three tables that have, hold real data, employee, department, and works in, and they're all going to use surrogate keys. So you're going to have real data and then surrogate keys. So that's what I'm actually planning to store. But you don't see this view, you see the three tables from the previous slide.
So now what happens? Well, you run any query you want to with the three tables you think exists. And underneath the sheets, uh, I'm going to simply map those from your logical view to this surrogate key view. So I'll, I'll, when you run a query, I'm going to run a little different query that has, that replaces all the keys with surrogate keys. And I will then map internally. Uh, when you get the answer back, I'm going to map it back uh, to real keys. So uh, map internally from the user view to what's actually physically there. Now, I'm going to completely disallow you from ever seeing surrogate keys. They're hidden from you completely. You see the key Mike Stonebreaker. You don't see the key, you know, uh, a 64-bit bit string. I'm also going to disallow you to have copies of stuff. Uh, that's going to mean no materialized views, no, no copies. Uh, and that means that Mike Stonebreaker only appears once in the entity table, in the employee entity table, and then everywhere else, it's a bunch of surrogate keys uh, for me. So what does that all mean? Well, that means life is really very straightforward. What I do is queries run normally. They, you get a view and they're mapped from your view into the surrogate view. But if I want to delete an entity, basically PII data says, uh, I want to delete all information on Mike Stonebreaker. So to do that, I just delete Mike Stonebreaker from the uh, employee entity table. That just, that takes one record delete. And that turns out to get rid of all of my personal data. Uh, the reason it gets rid of it is because it's now unreachable uh, because the mapping to surrogate keys is gone and I can lazily garbage collect uh, all of these, all of this surrogate key information. So the idea is really nice. Uh, this, may, this means that as long as you have a clean schema and as long as you do something like what I've just explained, Deleting, uh, deleting all of PII data is straightforward. And if you do it my way, it takes one record delete. You don't have to chase around uh, and find it all. It just, because the surrogates automatically uh, get rid of it. Uh, this can be made to work on any SQL database, including Postgres. Uh, the cleanest way to do it is with appropriate changes to the engine, uh, this mapping stuff. But if you want to do it in middleware outside the database system, you can do that too. So uh, as far as a single database uh, is concerned, if you have a clean schema, then you can deal with it fairly straightforwardly uh, and life is good. If you have a crufty gross schema, then this becomes a lot harder. So I think the best way to solve the right to be forgotten is with a clean, is with a clean schema. Okay, another whole bunch of questions. Uh, first one is, is this efficient enough to really be useful in practice? So real world DBAs often construct lousy schemas uh, for performance reasons, so they make queries go faster. Uh, you construct lousy schemas and it's going to make the right to be forgotten really difficult. So uh, my point of view is deal with this with clean schemas. Clean schemas are a really good idea no matter what. This would be a good way to force clean schemas on all your users. Uh, second question is, well, uh, well, this is all nice and good for a uh, greenfield uh, initial application, but what happens when business conditions can't change, the application has to change, the schema has to change, schema evolution uh, is required in all real-world applications. 
So the way people generally do this right now is they minimize application maintenance and let the schema become cruftier and cruftier. That of course just makes the right to be forgotten get really, really difficult. So this would, this whole approach would require you to keep the schema clean when applicate, when application and database evolution occurs. In my opinion, this is really good hygiene that enterprises don't do and should do. Uh, question three is a really interesting one, which is I just showed you how to delete all the PII data from Mike Stonebreaker. But if you are you know, a Postgres expert, you're about to tell me, well, it's still in the log. And that's absolutely true. And so to really do this right, you'd have to go into the log and update the log. That's a really dangerous thing to do. Uh, I really don't advise that at all. So you're just, in my opinion, the right thing to do is just trust uh, system administrators that they're not going to leak the log. Uh, and made worse, uh, if you are serious about your data, you've probably got offsite copies for disaster recovery. Uh, if you do, those have the PII data that you are trying to delete. So the question becomes, how are we really going to deal with uh, crash recovery data, either on site or off site. So there's a bunch of questions that I think are interesting to uh, seriously look at in this context. However, in my opinion, this is not the most dangerous, uh, dangerous problem with the right to be forgotten. What happens in real world enterprises is you have a lot of business units, many, many, many in big, big shops, and they silo uh, their uh, business unit to get stuff done. So that means there are lots and lots of data silos all over the enterprise. So the trouble is, is that uh, if I'm in charge of uh, customer data, and you're in charge of supplier data, you may want to read my customer data. And so what you do is you read PII data from my database, which I call database one. You write it into your database, which is database two. And now you have a copy. I've disallowed copies if you follow uh, my tactics for a single database. But that doesn't keep you from copying PII data from one database to a second database. And this is a very typical tactic in a legacy data siloed world. And so copies of data are all over the enterprise. So the problem you have is that just deleting it from the customer database isn't good enough. You've got to find all the copies of personal data all over the enterprise and delete them all. So the problem is cancerous. It goes all over the enterprise. So how do we deal with that? Uh, in my opinion, uh, you, can't, you can't disallow applications reading PII data. After all, that's what they do sometimes. So what you have to do is log whenever they copy it to someplace else. Well, that requires you to sandbox the application. So you have an application that reads PII data. I put a moat around that application so that whenever you copy data out of that moat, I log any reads and writes of personal data to my storage sort of off here on the side. So I remember when you copy data, my data from DB1, to DB2. And by the way, when I copy the data, I'm actually copying it to an application somewhere else, and it's going to put it into DB2. So if 
the application I'm copying it to is not sandboxed, then I have to disallow that copy because otherwise he can spread it all over everywhere and I'll never know. So disallow any tr data transfers to non-sandboxed applications. So if that application that is the one dealing with DB2 in turn wants to copy stuff somewhere else, it's sandboxed and it will get logged. So you just log any copies of PII data around the enterprise. And, uh, and then what you do is that if you want to delete Mike Stonebreaker uh, as PII data, you process this log off in the corner to find everywhere my data went to. Now this has a whole bunch of problems. First is it's trickier than you think. Uh, first of all, I may read Mike Stonebreaker and I might write it as MR Stonebreaker. So I can do transformations. Uh, I can write it into a lookup table and then copy data out of that lookup table somewhere else. So it's tricky to keep track of all the copies. Uh, also, if you allow uh, my PII data to be written to the screen, there's nothing that prevents the user from writing down my social security number and sending it to his friend in email. So this leaks if you allow writes to the screen. So at some level you have to trust users or you can't let them uh, access data. But anyway, this has to be dealt with, with sandboxing uh, and logging and it's trickier than you think to actually make this work. So that's sort of the application level. And of course, uh, if you sandbox everything, uh, is this non-intrusive enough to work? Uh, or are your users going to scream at you loudly enough that you can't do it? And of course, can this be made efficient enough uh, and simple enough that you can actually get it to work? So lots of questions at this application level, just like there were lots of questions at the database level. But now we go to another GDPR tenant, which is to say that if I request you to delete something uh, and then I claim you didn't do it, uh, then I can appeal to the European Union and say, I don't think uh, that company X is, uh, is correctly deleting my data as a result of GDPR. And the EU uh, will ask you, well, how, how do you know that you deleted all of Mike Stonebreaker's data? The standard response, which is what's given you know, to the EU by current uh, European IT shops, is, you know, here's the script I ran uh, to comply with this uh, personal PII data delete request. So here's what I did, and I claim that it did it all. Uh, and how do I know that the script is up to date? You know, I don't. Did the script find all instances? Well, maybe, maybe not. So this is certainly not very good evidence. Uh, this, is, this is evidence that I did something but it's certainly not evidence that I found all copies of Mike Stonebreaker's PII and uh, deleted them. So this sort of answer may not be good enough in the long term. So we may have to do better when you're asked to certify that you actually did the correct deletes. So what do you do? Well, I think it would be interesting to write a crawler that will search the entire enterprise for cells that should be deleted. Uh, so I think, you know, it would be the script is simply a collection of deletes. I think it would be more interesting to write a crawler that will try and find them all and see if you can find any more. Uh, it's, this is a research problem. This is not, this is not exactly trivial. Uh, this certainly requires read access to all databases by whoever is doing this. Uh, 
typically the chief data officer, CDO. Uh, if you don't have a CDO, you should. If your CDO doesn't have read access to all enterprise data, then he should, because I don't know how he does his job with, uh, you know, effectively without this. So this crawler could replace the script and it should be workable, uh, I think. Uh, but of course, it has the same transformations problem uh, that we've uh, pointed out on the previous slide. So, but I think it would be interesting to try and do this. Uh, the problem is this won't find fuzzy duplicates. So if I'm Mike Stonebreaker one place, I'm Mike Stonebreaker misspelled in another place, I'm M Stonebreaker in a third place and so forth. So if you wanna actually find fuzzy duplicates, then life gets a whole lot harder. So uh, this, this becomes effectively an, uh, trying to find fuzzy duplicates so that you can get rid of them. Uh, this is an entity consolidation problem between silos of information. Uh, this becomes a big headache in its own right. Uh, the tr traditional techniques, doing extract, transform, and load, and master data management are too human intensive to scale to the enterprise. Uh, new machine learning tools have a possibility of working much better. Uh, we'd love to try out state-of-the-art tools on the data for an example enterprise to see if we could actually make this work. So these are a couple of research ideas on how to, uh, how to deal with auditing off into the future in a better way. So in summary, privacy is almost certainly going to become more important. If you're in Europe, you already have to deal with it. Uh, it's going to be a bigger deal. Uh, there's going to be a lot more legislation uh, off into the future, I'm absolutely sure. Number one, if you, if you are a European citizen and your, uh, and your some uh, data and some, some website has personal data on you, if they're not in the EU, they're not, they're not subject to GDPR. So all I have to do is run a data center, you know, in the Maldives and I'm home free. So there's going to have to be more legislation to tighten up these rules. Uh, the U.S. Uh, is certainly going to have legislation off into the future to deal with the enormous amount of information that the big websites are keeping on you. Uh, so it's going to be a lot more important. This is going to be a big, big issue. If you force clean schemas, that will help a lot. So that will, that will help you with a lot, a lot with dealing with GDPR and its successors and disallowing willy nilly copying of data among silos will help a lot. So those are the two tactics that I think will help you a lot. And if you can move aggressively in this direction, your downstream uh, privacy issues are going to become easier to deal with. So that's the last slide. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to answering your questions uh, during the live presentation of this talk. Thank you very much. Great, well, welcome everyone. Let's take a few questions here. The first question is, how does the right to right to be forgotten play with regulatory needs for audit trails? Uh, right. I mean, that, that, that question was addressed, you know, in the final part of the talk that, that you were, you were going to have to have, you're going to have to have audit trails and, and you are going to have to read, read them to figure out where, where copied, copied data went to. And so, so effectively, this is going to require a lot more auditing than than has been done in the past. But that that will be that will be a fundamental tactic uh, for sure in certifying uh, 
that you did what you said you were going to do. Right. So the next question is, how do you handle personal information when it leaks into unrelated columns? For example, an employee has a text-free description that contains their full name and other personal details, which remain even when a record is orphaned. Yes. The, <clears throat> if you don't have a clean schema, life gets really, really, really hard. And, and you, you just indicated one example of a non-clean ER schema. So, so the best answer to that question is, force a clean ER schema, which, which, you know, disallows these fuzzy copies of, of information in, in unrelated fields, because finding them and deleting them is, is really, really hard. Great. The next question is, you mentioned that crawlers should be able to read all the D DDs to find data for GDPR. Does that mean the audit logs should also be deleted containing the GDPR data? Oh, this, this, this becomes, this, this is an interesting technical question, which goes back to uh, if, if I asked to delete uh, Mike Stonebreaker's personal information, that his personal information is still in the log. And no, no DBA, no, no system administrator is going to be very happy if you write, if you write a log munger that's going, that's going to try and diddle the log to get rid of that personal data. And so, so the answer is there's a, there's a ton of ancillary information for auditing recovery, uh, disaster recovery and what and it seems to me fundamentally that this this is going to have to be dealt with by legislation uh, if if you force a literal interpretation of Mike Stonebreaker's data has to go away then you're effectively forced to munge the log which I think is an awful idea and then you're forced to send somebody out to the backup tapes that are underneath the mountain, uh, bring them back and munge those. And, and so I think this, this becomes very difficult technically, very dangerous technically. And ultimately, you know, the, ultimately this is a legal, a legal issue as to whether, what, what constitutes good enough effort. And I know, as you had reminded me before the talk, you're not a lawyer and you don't play one on television, right? So we're kind of leaving <laughs> to the lawyers. Right? Great. Well, Michael, thank you for joining but, us today. I think that's it for the questions. But, but I think, but oh, I think just one, one last point, which is I have met a bunch of lawyers who are dealing with GDPR, and most of them are technically uh, not sophisticated. And to get good legislation in this area requires technical yeah. sophistication and legal sophistication, which is in really short supply. So I think yeah. we need we need some smarter lawyers or some techies who know something about legal stuff. Yeah, and then combine it with the people who actually write the laws, right? And it gets to be fairly complicated. Well, thanks again for joining us. Just as a reminder to people out there, in about six hours, we're going to be picking up again with our Asia Pacific track. For those of you maybe who are, who are night owls or up on the West Coast or just don't sleep a lot at night, we'll be having a couple of talks on Singapore Standard Time. There'll be four talks. And then also uh, we have some talks on the on Central European time that kick off around 3 a.m. Eastern time or 9 a.m. Central European time. And if you still want to keep socializing, head over to the lounge here in the Entrato platform. There are some people hanging out there chatting away and talking about all things that are great with Postgres. With that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today, and we'll catch you all uh, tomorrow.